It is very good to be here. I must admit I was not expecting to be brought to tears three times before I came up to the podium. I, um, my first public lecture was when I was eight years old. Lecture might be a strong word. <laughs> um, and it was a celebration of the King holiday. I had moved to Massachusetts with my mother from our shared birthplace of Birmingham, Alabama, and I was enrolled in a sort of um, hippie-ish, progressive school. And it was before the King holiday was nationally recognized. And my mother went to the administration of the school because they thought themselves, you know, rather progressive for having the day off before um, the holiday was acknowledged. And my mother said, oh no, this should be a day on. Um, and insisted that they begin um, programming. And then I was enlisted to, to deliver the I Have a Dream speech. Um, and I, I thought about that as I was sitting here because it is very clear that Valparaiso is a place that understands that this is to be a day on. Uh, and I am moved and appreciative of that. I also was um, brought to think about um, Dr. King's first public speech when he was 14 years old at the Colored Elks Club in Atlanta, Georgia, in which he talked about uh, the dual responsibilities to fight fascism abroad in the context of World War II uh, and the apartheid state of Jim Crow and the American South. And in this speech, he cited the song that we sang together, just now, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is a commonplace uh, for young black people in the segregated South. So I have all these um, thoughts in my head at once. Um, and then I had another before I get, I'm gonna talk about King and his life. Um, but as I was actually preparing, um, what the figure who came first into my mind was Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, orator, writer, constitutional thinker, who made his way from being an enslaved person in Maryland to the international stage. His most famous speech, titled What to the Slave of the, is the Fourth of July, came to mind. Delivered in 1852, with growing sectional tensions afoot, Douglas stood up on July 5th and argued that American Independence Day was a cruel gesture for the enslaved that the praiseworthy principles of the American project, such as liberty, citizenship, and freedom, were hypocrisy to the enslaved people of the United States because they lacked all of those things, freedom, liberty, and citizenship. It was a paradoxical celebration at best because it was of a freedom that was held exclusive and exclusionary. And today I would ask a comparable question to Douglas's. What to the oppressed is the King holiday? As far as this nation has come, we would be dishonest if we pretended as though the scourge of racism and the seemingly countless other isms, classism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, the aversions and the injustices that we take for granted that we just accept, did not exist, they remain. We commemorate the vision of the freedom movement as the battle is still being waged for freedom. Now commemoration is traditionally understood as a form of remembrance, right? a ceremonial form of remembrance. And while it's extremely important for the nation to acknowledge the incredible transformations wrought by the civil rights movement, we have to treat that memory not as a past, or not merely as a past, but as a present reckoning. We not only remember, we witness the present challenges. And as such, then, we are called to actively remember. These are not mere details of what happened when, which march, which protest, which piece of legislation. 
the history of King and of the movement more broadly provide guidance or better yet challenges to us in the present moment and that's what I want to focus my remarks on today. And I want to think about three distinct challenges that this holiday makes of us. One is how to follow in the legacy of Dr. King and, and the freedom movement. Two, how to learn from that legacy. And three, how to extend that legacy. So start with how to follow. It's first matter. Uh, we are in a heady and conflict-filled political season. And at times it seems as though all of our struggles seem to be held hostage to the politicking of election cycles. We're reminded that we should be strategic about we, what we protest and what we advocate for in service of particular electoral outcomes. But I would argue that one of the most important lessons of the movement was rejecting political expediency in the service of what is right above all. This, is a, this was unpopular then, and it's kind of unpopular now. But I want to tell a story um, you may have heard about. It actually doesn't include Dr. King himself, but includes one of his representatives. In 1963, Birmingham, Alabama, my, my birthplace, was in the midst of what was called the Children's Crusade. You have seen the footage, of course, of the hoses and the dogs and the children uh, caged at the fairgrounds who were protesting um, Jim Crow in Birmingham. And in the midst of all this, Robert F. Kennedy, the brother of the president, called James Baldwin and said, can you bring some of your friends? We want to have a conversation about this civil rights movement thing. And they went to the Kennedy apartment uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. The people were there, included James Baldwin, Lorraine Hansberry, Lena Horn, um, representative of Dr. King, his attorney, uh, Jerome Smith, who is a civil rights worker in the Delta, Harry Belafonte, Rip Torn. Um, and at the meeting, the, the initial impetus for it was that RFK was interested in finding a way to get these public figures, these very prominent African Americans, to make um, the argument that the people in Birmingham should kind of quell some of their protests because it was seen as threatening to the political futures of the Democratic Party. They were in for a surprise. So there was an awkwardness at the beginning. Um, and Jerome Smith, who is a veteran um, and who just happened to be up in New York because he had been beaten so badly in Mississippi that he needed to have surgery. Uh, said to the to RFK something about you know their failures um, to advocate for civil rights while still expecting black people to go fight wars abroad, and you know he wasn't one of the famous people in the room, and so apparently and there's many accounts of this meeting RFK kind of um, turned away from him as if to suggest you're not really who I'm here to talk to. And this incensed Lorraine Hansberry, who was at that point the most famous black playwright in the country. She took over the meeting. Um, and she said, uh, in effect, that not only were they not going to attempt to quell the people of Birmingham in their protests, that those people spoke for them. And that instead of going to minister to the populace that was fighting for the freedom of everybody, in that room, amongst many others, that way that they wanted a moral commitment from the administration on the part uh, when it came to civil rights. She stood up, walked out, everybody followed with her, um, and the newspapers reported, because there were uh, there was some press coverage, that the meeting was seen as a failure. But it was soon thereafter that the administration, the, the White House began to talk about civil rights as a matter of a moral commitment. Now, if they had listened um, to the sort of prevailing wisdom about politicking, they might have 
been uh, uh, caught up in the go slow message that they were initially presented with. But instead of political expediency, they went with what was right. That's at least one of the ways we follow the legacy of the movement. We ought to keep today, you ought today to keep in mind in the chaos of this moment that as Frederick Douglass once said, power concedes nothing without a demand. And the fight for freedom is often inconvenient, but it's always right. If we turn back to King himself, we can see this in a especially sharp fashion. He is a person who grew up middle class as a scion of Atlanta's black elite. He could have slipped into the most comfortable of positions afforded to black people in the segregated South. Someone with a, 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 a a very respectable education, prominence as a religious leader. So the journey of his life ought to be understood as one that entailed risk and cost. You heard a piece of the letter from a Birmingham jail earlier, and if you recall, he spoke to fellow pastors in that letter, black and white, who, while proclaiming common feeling with the principle of justice, were worried about how impolitic his protests were. And what's important about that is that he disrupted his position, his status, in order to tell the truth, right? even behind bars. This again continued through the various cycles of elections, right? vagaries of political moments, through the Vietnam War, through the Memphis sanitation strike at the end of his life. And it's important to remember that at the very tail end of his life, he was um, more unpopular than acclaimed. He spent more of his life being seen as a troublemaker, as, a dis as someone who disturbed the status quo, quo in ways that were unacceptable than he did as America's hero. Two, on following the legacy. Martin Luther King Jr., like members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the NAACP and other civil rights organizations, were often students. And I don't mean, some of them were students in the formal sense, or college students, but I mean students in life. They studied how systems of economic exploitation violence, and Jim Crow operated in tandem. They also studied the history of other nations and regions. Following the legacy requires of us that we function as students of the world, similarly. To weave together an understanding of the relationships between histories of injustice. So for King, a student of the injustices of colonialism and militarism, and imperialism right, came to the position uh, of being critical of the Vietnam War by, by means of studying and thinking beyond his immediate circumstance, even as dire as the circumstances were for black Americans at the time of his life. And that leads me to the third point, that following the legacy requires a willingness to evolve, because justice is the underpinning, not the doctrine, right? So what I mean is this, so when people, you know, one of the things I think is sort of entertaining is that um, people block it a lot now, but when years ago, you almost always had people who would check their political affiliation on Facebook, right? You would have, like, what are, you, what are your politics? And what's interesting about it is that it presumes that you take a set of positions and then that becomes your identity. And I actually think what it means to be a student of the world and a warrior for justice requires openness to evolution because you're consistently learning how power, how inequality, how opportunity, how freedom are shaped or denied. Right? Um, so there's an evolution that takes place. King's witness to uh, the violence of racism in Chicago and Cicero, for example, without the de jure segregation of the South, 
was part of what pushed him to be a much more aggressive uh, voice when it came to economic injustice. When he was experiencing pressure from youth activists, though he was still quite young himself, it also pushed him to think more deeply about the political economy, as well as what kind of uh, vision for electoral politics we would have once uh, the right to vote actually became real for black people in the South. Right? So the, the, the final days of his life spent in Memphis, uh, supporting the strike of sanitation workers. And I just want to talk a little bit about what happened in Memphis to illustrate uh, the point about what it is uh, to follow today and this legacy. So in 1968, in February, which is um, uh, an important month in African American history because of the historic celebration first of Negro History Week and then of Black History Month, Two black men who were garbage collectors in Memphis were crushed to death by a malfunctioning truck. Um, and this tended to have, there were rules about sort of where black people who were sanitation workers could stand on the back of the truck and they were always exposed to all of the elements because they couldn't get in the bed of the truck. Um, and a whole range of injustices were, were standard uh, in Memphis's Department of Public Works. And, in response to their death and getting a very minimal settlement from the city, 1,300 black workers from the Department of Public Works went on strike. Um, and, and, uh, and supported union organizing for sanitation workers. Um, and there had been a consistently wor worsening condition even in the midst of their organizing. Um, many sanitation workers actually were paid so little that they were on um, public assistance, not unlike workers today at Walmart, relying on food stamps to feed their families. So King, um, inspired by this organizing, joined the strike. And it was a complicated thing for him to join because not everybody, not all of the organizers in Memphis were interested in nonviolent resistance. Not all of them were interested in the ways in which King had traditionally led protests, and yet he still thought it was important to join the, the, the strike. In addition, there were members of his organization who said this was taking him too far afield of his central mission, which was to desegregate. So he had internal conflict. He arrived on April 3rd, and he was asked to speak to the crowd of the sanitation workers at one of the mass meetings. And he preached a, pre a sermon that you have, I'm sure you are familiar with, which is often referred to as the mountaintop sermon. And he said to the group prophetically, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. And then the next day, he's assassinated. Now there are people who will call what we live in today the promised land, despite abundant evidence that this is not the beloved community that King witnessed on top of that proverbial mountaintop. And that brings me to the next point, which is how we learn from the legacy. Because we're not there yet. Uh, one thing that's undeniable and I'm so glad that I, I'm, I'm not gonna, what I'm about to say, I'm not throwing shade on anybody because thus far everybody has honored King beautifully. But it's undeniable that we've experienced the Disneyfication of Dr. Martin Luther King, okay? That we have to contend with the gap between the king of our national mythologies and the king who was a freedom fighter. 
The convenience of the repetition of the I Have a Dream segment of the speech at the March on Washington is made um, alarmingly clear by virtue of the absence of the discussion of his bounced check metaphor in that same speech. So nowadays, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the blessing. The dream, what you hear, some will tell you, means to not pay attention to, to race at all or any form of inequality. We we'll just pretend it doesn't exist. We'll call it blind, right? They will tell you that it's about pretending to not see one of the sharpest social divisions in human history, race in the United States, right? We have the Disney-fied king who is celebrated by corporations that mistreat their workers and politicians eager to cage people in the way that King was caged. Right? That famous speech, however, garners its meaning alongside the other part of the speech, and I want to offer a little bit of it up to you. He said, and this is April 28, 1963, in a sense we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men and women and non-binary people, yes, black men and women and non-binary people, as well as white men and women, and non-binary people and people of all the varying uh, racial identifications that we have in a global society would be guaranteed the inalienable, inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. Now. We have only to look in our prisons and our purged voter rolls and the gaps between our schools and the gaps in life expectancy, gaps between states as dramatic as gaps between races when it comes to life expectancy, to see that there remains a defaulted promissory note. So if this commemoration of King that we do every year is to be sincere, then we have to learn from the fact that the work of the freedom movement is unfinished, that it has been co-opted. And we have to find ways to resist co-optation. And one of the best ways is to insist upon the full story. Right? So not only is King made two-dimensional, but we have also seen him made signature, singular. Right? So for example, to go back to the March on Washington, there's a reason you don't hear any of the women speak in the footage. Okay? There's also a reason that it's only very recently that you've gotten, we begin to have a more broad conversation of even how did the Montgomery bus boycott happen? Right? So the standard narrative has become, because we focus on a single charismatic leader, that King went there and led a boycott as opposed to the truth, which was a committee largely made of women educators, black women educators, who were organizing uh, on, uh, against segregation in Montgomery, Alabama. Right? So Rosa Parks, but also Joanne Robinson and E.D. Nixon. Right? And even before them, right, the history, longer history, of the NAACP as a tightly networked uh, organization of local branches throughout the South, the beginning really aggressively in the 19 teens. And even before that, the civic organizations that sprung up at the dawn of Jim Crow between 1896 and 1900. Right? This long history, this long underpinning that in fact made King possible, 
both in terms of the foundation but also in terms of the community around him, has been too often neglected. Um, I may, I, it reminds me actually of um, Ella Baker, who was uh, the architect of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, who had worked for King and the SCLC, and they butted heads a bit because she was, she would say, strong people don't need strong leaders. And she was an advocate for what is described most often now as a participatory democracy and not the kind of um, top-down model of leadership. And what she did is she took the students who were connected to LCLC, SCLC and said, what kind of movement would you create? And they really became the people who were the foundation for the struggle for voting rights, young people who had a deeply democratic model of working in the Mississippi Delta and connecting with local leadership um, and engaging in both civic and political education as well. When I was a little girl, I'll just say a quick aside, but I, uh, Robert Moses, who was one of the SNCC uh, organizers, really was sort of, he's a, he's a math guy, and so he did a lot of the architecture of the movement. Uh, lived around the corner from me, and when Ella Baker would come visit him, he would have me come and take her to the park. Um, and by that time, she was she was struggling with dementia, and I can distinctly remember walking her to the park. And we would sit and watch the sunset in the late afternoon, um, and it was a it, this that simple moment. I had a sense of her significance for the movement, but the moment was so profound for me because the expectation of care from a young person, right, as a child who was supposed to tend to an elder, but if someone could call my mother and say, send Imani over to come do this thing, that that actually was a part of the very foundation that produced the movement, a sense of interdependence, a sense of interconnection. It's not just the big moments, right? Or another uh, uh, thread we could follow, right? So we often hear the story of the movement in terms of the public events, right? Not the day-to-day -day organizing. We hear the tradition, as Charles Payne describes it, of mass mobilization and not the organizing tradition. But we also don't hear uh, nearly enough about the litigation strategy of the NAACP. Two decades of cases brought before Brown v. Board of Education has decided dismantling formal legal segregation in the American South. Now, actually dismantling it is a different matter, but the legal support dismantled and led by Charles Hamilton Houston, who decided to create at Howard University's law school a laboratory for the dismantling of Jim Crow. Again, as integral to the struggle, as the work of SCLC or SNCC or CORE, or any of these, or, the, or you know, the, the educational organizations in Montgomery, or any of these organizations, right? So that when you got students from the North, black and white, coming into the Mississippi Delta and Louisiana and Alabama supporting the civil rights movement in the summer of 1964, there was a whole network of people prepared to support them. And there were a panoply of attorneys ready to uh, work on their behalf. Right? And that's why all those pieces, I, I, I think, is, is so, is precisely why this language was so beautifully uttered by um, the students up here of our time is such a powerful concept because it is always time. And work that may not seem immediately impactful to you could be precisely the kind of a, an element of ignition, right, and igniting uh, labor that precipitates huge social transformation. Um, so we have to be careful about not valuing all of the elements and just what we tend to see on the screen. And I'll just add one more element. Um, before moving on to thinking about how we extend the, uh, extend the legacy. Um, one of my favorite stories about the freedom movement in the Mississippi Delta came from Indisha Idame Holland, who was a theater professor who has since passed away, wrote um, a beautiful memoir from the Mississippi Delta. 
And she talks about she was um, you know, a, a, a sex worker in Mississippi when the, freedom, when the uh, SNCC people came down. And she was walking down the street and she was trying to seduce Bob Moses, who was this very kind of reserved, eyeglass, super quiet guy. And she's walking behind him trying to seduce him and he's kind of ignoring her. And then she finally catches up to him and he says, are you, are you interested in joining the movement? Um, not what she was looking for, <laughs> but became the, the guiding force of her life. Um, and I thought about that, and that when I was, wa I was watching a, recent, a documentary about um, uh, a woman named Nellie Jackson, who was uh, known as Mississippi Madam Ma Natchez, Miss, uh, Mississippi, who led a house of ill repute. Um, and when uh, SNCC workers uh, began to protest in Natchez and, and were arrested, experiencing all these kids, teenagers, or, um, were subject to mass arrest. The Mississippi madam, who was very connected to lots of powerful people, went down to the jail and insisted that they release the young civil rights protesters. And all of that is, uh, you know, is, is both um, a reminder to not limit our vision of the participation in the freedom struggle to those who are seen as respectable, right? um, but it's also a reminder of the complex network of forces and voices. I mean, it, it makes me think of um, a, a, a section in the Bible when Nathaniel, when Philip is telling Nathaniel, you know, Jesus has come, Jesus of Nazareth is coming, and Nathaniel said, is anything good gonna come out of Nazareth? And he said, yeah, something good is gonna come out of Nazareth, right? Um, so all of that to say, right, Without a truer history, a fuller history, we consistently fail to apprehend what is necessary to engage in a social justice movement. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to give you one more example, because I thought about it just as I was sitting here, of um, Bayard Rustin. How many folks have heard of Bayard Rustin? It's my handful. So Bayard Rustin is the person who was the architect of the March on Washington. You don't know his name because he was an openly gay black man. We tend not to know his name because, because even though you know, he was on the cover of Time magazine the week of the March on Washington, but he has been scrubbed from history. And in one of the you know, King's uh, weakest moments in his career, uh, he was discouraged from giving credit and, affiliated with, and be affiliating with Rustin under threat from others in the civil rights community who said, if you continue to hang out and listen to Rust, and we'll say, you're gay too. Okay. Moment of uh, a moral failing, as all human beings have on the part of King. So yet another dimension for another arena to tell the story more, more fully. Similarly, Fred Shuttlesworth, the fire band brand leader, extraordinary of Birmingham, Alabama, responded when James Baldwin came down south to give voice to the struggle, responded to him with a uh, blatantly homophobic uh, aversion, hostility. This person who was going to tell the world about the struggles in the deep south. So when we tell the fuller story, we also have to tell the story of the limitations, right? In order to get it right the next time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we tell the fuller story, of course, because we tend to sit and wait for leaders, assuming that if there was only the right person to stand in front of us, we could get to work. But that's not, in fact, how movements work. And the study of movements will teach you that. They are always community enterprises. The leaderships are thrust, the leadership is thrust into greatness. The leadership doesn't start the movement. At best, they are servants of the collective. Servants of the collective energy, not directors of the theater of protest. How do we extend the legacy today in our time? The issues are not altogether different but the architecture demands some new tools. One of the things I've been saying for much of my life 
because um, I spent my life being homesick, but that's a whole other story. You don't need to hear about all that. But is that I often say that I was born nine years after and a few miles away from the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. And I say that because it's a way for me to anchor myself in the world, but also because it is how, um, it is the context in which I came of age. An awareness that the fact of um, my race, my gender, my body, my location, my birthplace, that um, is a profound vulnerability that I was born into. But more recently, I have found myself saying that I was born in the city that had the most toxic air in the nation in 1972, the year of my birth. Coal mines and steel mills have shortened the life expectancy in Birmingham. And though I'm not an epidemiologist, I would guess that the panoply of chronic diseases that I and many members of my family have has something to do with all that poison in the air. There's a corporation in Birmingham that is known as one of the uh, 10 worst polluters on the planet. It continues to be one of the worst violators of environmental um, uh, well-being in the world. And if you go down south and you drive along um, I-10, along the Gulf Coast, the waterways that fed the transatlantic slave trade are poisoned, dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. We are feeding climate disaster from the BP oil spill right, to all of the detritus in the Mississippi River. There's poverty in the Delta and the Black Belt and also in the cities. Class inequality has actually been exacerbated in recent years. Right? We have children abandoned and imprisoned, stolen, not abandoned, stolen and imprisoned at the border. I sometimes think we wake up every morning knowing that there are infants in cages at the border and we go about our days, there's, there's a deep moral deficit in that orientation to the world. And juvenile facilities where there are children whose lives are destroyed, two million people are in cages. And I say that very explicitly, cages as opposed to incarcerated. We lock people in cages, millions of people in cages, right? We have continued hostility over gender, sexuality, difference. Some regions of the cities and the some regions of the country, the country flourish, some are impoverished. In this exact, exact same city, you can look down from a multi-million dollar penthouse onto people living on the street. And even as virtually everyone here, I would guess, occupy the position of the 99%, Many of us are quick to praise those with too much and hold a general resentment toward the least of these. So it's, what this demands of us is something quite daunting. So we find ourselves with a sense of urgency. Right? We think about all that's wrong in the world, but also a feeling of inadequacy. How do I do this? I keep saying, you know, people say to ask me sometimes, well, how do you hold on to hope? Hope is not an organic feeling for me at this moment. Um, it's not an organic feeling. It's, it's, uh, it, it's a praxis, something I practice. It's a commitment, something deliberate. Right? I don't just feel it, I create it. And we all have to do that. And we have to ask, how do we refuse cynicism today? Because our sense of incapacity in the face of behemoth, the first level of our response is fear. The secondary level is cynicism. Right? Because we're, this is huge figure, interlocking, interlocking structures of power that stretch across the world in ways both seen and unseen. And I think a prerequisite to even beginning to try to do something that makes a difference is that we have to learn to acknowledge that this is slow work and that the vast majority of it is unseen no matter how many times you see the famous protester on the cover of the newspaper. 
right? Usually, almost always, it's slow work. We are encouraged to look at the spectacle, but freedom is pursued in the most intimate of moments over time. Repeatedly, people say, what would you have people do? I always say, find an issue that you can commit to for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. That's all you have to do. If we all did that, the transformation of education would be extraordinary. Another piece of this, though, goes back to the mountaintop speech for me. So when King had that vision the night before he died, um, we talk about his prophetic, but he knew something was coming around the corner. But it also is important to think about what he was seeing. Because that something is our anchor, that thing. And I, this is particularly, I'm particularly interested and the young people here, because some of, you know, sometimes it's hard to move those of us who are old and grisly. Um, but I implore you to develop a vision of the good society. How would you have the world be where there are no impediments? Right? When King had that mountaintop vision, right, um, it was one that was not contained by the endless constraints that we're told every day prevent fairness and decency and shelter and comfort and food, nourishment and the ability to grow. But the value of having the vision, right, even if you have been told in every, every possible way that it can't be realized is that it becomes the foundation for your ethical commitments as you move through life. It becomes something that you share. It become, you become an agent of that vision. Right? And then the next piece of the challenge is to meld that private vision, that dearly held vision, with a collective purpose with other people. Uh, we are charged with understanding that singular leadership cannot do what only community can do, which means that we have to set aside our ego frequently because we have to have an ethic of sharing power in order to get the best work done. Right? Now for those of us who teach, and we have a number of educators here today, especially those of us who teach history, have a particular purpose in this as well. right? Um, because we have to service the reminders that history should not be a collection of facts wrapped around a national myth not a gospel, but in fact a tool to exercise the moral imagination for the future. Okay. So the personal, you know, the personal dimension of the vision of a good society. Okay. And then we also have the task as we learn together, as we are members of the communities of learning, to think about how we go into the archives of knowledge in order to best exercise the moral imagination of the future. One of the most important aspects of this is that we don't make apologetics for the evil in the past. Right? You can say, yes, things were like that then, but look how unjust it was. Why didn't the people listen to the folks who were bearing witness to injustice? Why weren't people moved? What was the thing that got in the way, right? Because that's what will be useful for us as we imagine our collective future. Right? Now to bear prophetic witness in this way, and that's essentially what it is, right? Prophecy not as fortune telling, right? Prophecy is truth, right? As the truth of what can be, to bear prophetic witness is never easy. But the question I would ask, is who are we to think our task should be without difficulty when there are so many who pressed on for us to be here? One of the things that King said is that the future belongs to the creatively maladjusted. Right? Uh, and that's, for me, the point that I want to end on. Right? Um, but I, I want to give some context first. So, of course, universities are special places. I've spent my entire life in them, so obviously I think that's the case. But they're also places of this world, right? And we have these beautiful moments, but of course, 
all injustices that exist in the world exist in universities, right? There are unequal spaces, there are people who are mistreated, there's unfairness here, there. There are times when they are cruel institutions. But the one preserve that I cherish consistently about a place like this and a place like where I work in these, these institutions is that they are always places that in some significant measure cherish the imagination. And that's really what the creative maladjustment that King spoke of was about, right? And it's a word that we use too rarely when we talk about justice. But the imagination is the core principle because it's imagining a there that we have not yet achieved and we don't know how we're going to get there, but we're going to try. And it is the single most indispensable ingredient to freedom fighting. You have to be able to envision something better to make your way there. So I want to conclude by saying, I hope that this incredibly beautiful program today inspires us to imagine beautifully, boldly, and together for our collective human fortune. Thank you.